Good morning. It is wonderful to see all of us here today. The day of the Lord. We are excited that He is walking in us, walking through us. What a joy that is to know. So if you're visiting us for the first time, we at Calvary we love visitors and we love Jesus, we love His Word, so we go through it every Sunday, every Thursday as we gather together in His name. Amen. We are in Acts chapter 9. We continue from verse 10 to 22 for today. And before we read His Word, let us ask for His blessings. God, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege that you've given to us as your people to gather together in your name. This is your word, and we pray and ask that you would minister to us through it today as we read it. Grant us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding so that we will rightly apply what we see in your word. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we studied about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, and we continue to see it unfold and how the Lord is uh, beginning His work in this man who was terrible, a man who was out to destroy the church. Jesus told him, actually, that soul, soul, why are you persecuting me? And say, Lord, who are you? Say, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And the Lord caused him to be blind. He was blind for three days. Um, he didn't also eat. Probably that was his own choice not to. But nonetheless, it was three days. And we begin with another person introduced to us, and let us see as we read through. Now there was a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the streets called straight and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered the Lord, I have heard from many about this man. How much harm he has done to your saint in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. 
Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose, so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest? But Saul increased more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. Now another man is introduced to us alongside Saul of Tarsus. This man is called Ananias. The Bible says, now there was a certain disciple. It is indeed amazing how we see through all the scripture that God uses people regardless of the background, whether they're so learned, as we'll see Paul, you know, he's a learned man, he's being changed right now, there's a transformation, there's God's work happening in his life, he's very learned. Well, other people, like the apostles, many of them are not learned. You know, fishermen and tax collectors and all this group of people God is calling to himself. And now there's another man who we are not told many things about this, about his life right now at least. We are told a certain man. <laughs> there was just a man, a church member somewhere, a committed Christian somewhere. And the Lord is choosing to use this man to go and minister to Saul. And perhaps if the apostles were sent to Saul of Tarsus, maybe he would begin, you know, thinking that he's something great, that the Lord is only sending the apostles, only sending the chosen twelve to go minister to him. This man is not even amongst the deacons who are appointed at Jerusalem. He's just someone else. He's just a disciple in Damascus. This was a common name for those who followed Jesus Christ. The three names that were common, the disciples of the Lord, the saints, and the people of the way. And he's among them. Just a regular guy like you and I. And the Lord is choosing to send this man to Saul of Tarsus. Now there was a man, a certain man, named Ananias. He's from Damascus. And the Lord said to him in a vision. Now the Lord is speaking to him. This is a very wonderful vision or a dream that these people, Ananias and the Lord Jesus, are having a conversation. <laughs> They're talking to one another. And the Lord in a vision called him, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. Now mark the difference. When the Lord came upon Saul of Tarsus on the way, the Lord called unto Saul. He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? <laughs> you know the difference? For the people who are not walking with the Lord, they're like, who are you? What do you think you are? You know, in other words, he's saying, hey, introduce yourself. I want to know you. <laughs> but for those who are of the fold, when the Lord calls, do you know how you ought to respond? Here I am, Lord. That is the pre proper response for every one of us. Do you know the Lord? This is our response. Here I am, Lord. You remember Samuel? When he did know when the Lord was calling him. The Lord is calling him and he's confused. He thought Eli, the priest, was calling. He said, hey, you just called me. And the, the, the priest realized that it is the Lord calling this young man. 
And he said, next time you hear him call, says, here I am, Lord. And Ananias says, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. Now this is amazing to me also. To know that people can spend many, many years praying, but they're not praying. Saul of Tarsus, because he was a devoted Jew, he prayed three times daily. <laughs> he prayed in the morning, noontime, in the evening. He prayed all the time. The question is, did he pray just as a customary or did he really pray to Yahweh? Because right now, the Lord is saying, you will go and find him. And you know what he's doing? He's praying right now. He's praying. Friends, this is a different kind of prayer than what he's ever prayed before. Maybe before he prayed that, Lord, thank you for making me a man. Like these people would pray. Thank you that I'm not like these other people. The Pharisees. They prayed this kind of prayers. They thought that the hand of God was only upon them, not any other person. They were the greatest. But then, think about it. He's, he, he doesn't have vision for these three days. He's not eating food for these three days. What is happening in the life of this man right now? What is he thinking about? He's read a lot of books, a lot of things. He knows the Torah, he knows the prophecies that are written about the Messiah. Yet, he's never accepted this Jesus as the Messiah. And I think what is happening here, maybe he's thinking about the wonder of the incarnation. The wonder of a God-man. The wonder of God, the creator, becoming a man, living amongst us, yet we missed him and we've read about his prophecies. We don't know him, yet he's lived with us, he is with us, but we are disregarding him. Maybe he's thinking about when the temple guards went and brought in Jesus with these religious leaders before Caiaphas to be questioned. And Paul is thinking, man, did, did we really know what we were doing? Perhaps he, he, right now he knows they were ignorant. He's thinking about the disciple being brought before the, the, the chief elders, the religious leaders, and they're, they're, they're preaching to them Jesus, they're preaching the resurrection of Jesus, and Saul is thinking about all these things. Thinking about Stephen, who was just stoned the other day, and he was right there, hearing Stephen preaching to them, giving them a very wonderful history lesson that they were forgetting. And Stephen said, I see the heavens open. I see Jesus. And Saul is thinking, man, is that the same Jesus that appeared to me? The same Jesus that caused the, me to be blind? He hit me with blindness. If he's the same Jesus, I'm in trouble. I'm really in trouble thinking about Jesus. That was wonderful. And now his prayer changed. 
Maybe he's just pleading for God's forgiveness. Pleading for God's mercies. How is it possible that I have mistreated the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace? How is it possible? I love a song that was written by a group called Sovereign Grace. How low was our Redeemer brought? This is what they said. How low was our Redeemer brought? The King who held the stars lay helpless in a maiden's arm and pressed against her heart. While sheep and cattle raised their voices, the babe could speak no words. The ever-flowing springs of joy had come to share our thirst. How long was our Redeemer brought? How low was he brought? The Lord of the world. The Lord that the world obeyed would stumble as he learned to walk upon the ground he had made. The one that the angel bowed before would kneel to wash our stinky feet. And be at home among the poor, though he owned everything. How low was our Redeemer brought to raise us from our shame? And how... And now the highest praises of all belongs to Jesus' name. The healer wounded on a tree to bear our grief and sin. The king gave up his own crown so we could ever reign with him. How low was our redeemer brought? Think about it. He was wounded on that tree, the tree that he made, so that you and I would be healed from our sins. When every other cre creation, including the cattle and the sheep, they have mastered how to communicate to each other they can you know, raise their voices in the wilderness. Yet our king came and he was taught how to talk again. The wonder of incarnation. Think about it. And if this is what Paul is thinking about, this man will be humbled by this experience. To think that you have mistreated the king of kings. The Lord of Lords, the one who holds the earth. But Ananias was told to go. He was given a very clear direction. Go to this street called Street. You'll find this man called Saul of Tarsus. And he is praying. He's praying. It doesn't matter how great he was. He's right now asking for God's mercies. It doesn't matter how many things he's done to the church. He's now praying. So the Lord spoke and sent this man. And in a vision... He has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then now here comes the concern of this man, Ananias. Ananias answered the Lord in a vision. I have heard from many about this man. 
how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priest to bind all who called on your name. In other words, he's telling the Lord, before I go, think about the man you're sending me to. <laughs> you know, sometimes we can say things, it's a genuine concern, but we think the Lord, maybe he's not aware, he'll be surprised, like, whoa, is that real? <laughs> is that the man? Oh, sorry, man. <laughs> sorry about that. The Lord knows about this man. The Lord has arrested him already. He's under custody of the Lord. And this man is expressing some sort of concern or fear, I don't know. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine, to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And there, you know, Ananias will be like, yes! <laughs> now he must suffer? You got it, God. You got it. Because he's persecuted your church. He's killed many people. If he must suffer, that is the right thing to do. But you know, when he presented his concern before the Lord, the Lord did not even respond to that. <laughs> the Lord went straight ahead and said, hey, all right, go. <laughs> For he is a chosen vessel of mine. He is a murderer, but he is a chosen vessel. He is a persecutor of the church. He is a chosen vessel of mine. Remember, if this man... Maybe Saul of Tarsus and Moses. They are bringing their resume to the eldership of this church, presenting to us so that they'll be part of the eldership. And say, hey, I am a murderer. I have killed. I have run people out of church. <laughs> I bring people bound, take them to prison. I'll do, this is the least, and I want to be a pastor in this church. What would you do? Like, hey, welcome, brother. <laughs> you think that is what you're going to do? No, no, no. So thank you for showing your entrance. We shall let you know in due time. You got your number down? We'll give you a call. <laughs> You're there waiting for this call. It's three months down the line. Six months, one year. Did they lose my number? You know, you, you resend again your, uh, an email to remind them of your interest. This is the exact man that God is saying... He is a chosen vessel of mine. How do you know him? He's a murderer. He's persecuted the church. Forget about that. He is a chosen vessel of mine. I mean, how many times have we looked down on people who say, here to serve the Lord, the Lord has called me. And they're like, yeah. But not in this church. <laughs> the Lord has called you somewhere else. Well, of course, we got to have the wisdom to discern things and to know things. The Lord tells us not to be quick on laying hands on people before we know them. This is a very divine appointment that we are seeing here. He's my chosen one. The Lord did not go ahead to start to begin with Ananias like, oh, you know, this is who he was, and please just, you know, a little kindness here and there goes a long way. <laughs> that is not what God did. He said, go. It's amazing. Also, when the Lord is calling us, he doesn't call us to sit. He calls us 
to be on the move every time. He calls you, say, go. It's either he sends you to someone, he sends you to a different location, he sends you for a specific duty, he's saying, you go. In the Bible, we have a lot of people also that they, they thought the Lord maybe would not use them because of their, you know, past experiences of their past lives. You know, we know of Abraham, whom we are calling the, the father of faith. You know, at some point they even lost faith and they had a baby that was not the promised son. You remember that? We have a man called Samson, we have Moses, we have Peter, and we have Ananias right now. Have you ever felt that you are too weak, too inexperienced, or too imperfect to be used by God to fulfill his purposes? If you have, then it's time that you know that it is not our faithfulness, our righteousness, but God's faithfulness and the presence of Jesus in our lives that empowers our lives to do his will. It is his presence in our lives that gives us the strength to do so. Even when we are concerned about issues, this man, Ananias, had a very genuine concern. You know, Lord, I know what has been said about this man. He's destroyed your own people. Here, Ananias expresses a concern but not a refusal to obey God's command. He did not refuse to go. He was just speaking as a mere mortal man like you and I. To God, but what about this situation? What about this? What about this? As much as it can be a big concern on our part, God had already fixed it before you even thought about it. <laughs> it is already fixed. You know what the Lord says? He is my chosen vessel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. I don't think there's any other person who suffer like this man. <laughs> Apart from our Lord Jesus Christ. All the other disciples, the apostles, they will suffer. They'll be hung. They'll be thrown into boiling oil. They'll be torn apart. But think about this man that is being called to this ministry. God say he's my chosen vessel. And when the Lord said these words, Ananias was like, Lord, you know better than I do. If you have chosen him, who am I to say no to the calling that you're giving to me? And do you know what this reminds us? That law, the Lord can use any ordinary person. Anyone can be used of God, regardless of your background, regardless of what you have done, regardless of what you have not done the Lord can still use you. The thing is, are you ready to obey when he calls? Saul would have thought he's that great man that the Lord is only sending the greatest, you know, he's sending the leadership. No, the Lord just sent someone, not even from Jerusalem, from Damascus a disciple of the Lord, a believer like you and I. But I believe he possessed the qualification that made the deacons to be appointed. You remember them? 
a man of good testimony, is walking with the Lord. A man filled with the Holy Spirit. A man of great wisdom. If these things are seen in people's lives, it doesn't matter who they are. God will use them. And you know what? God wants to use you. God wants to use you. You know, God, God is not using people because, you know, he saw something great in you. <laughs> because you were worthy, so God chose to use you. No, 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 no. He remembers also that we are just but dust of the ground. Nothing in us can cause him to use us this way. It is what he's actually put in us. His righteousness that has been imputed in us. You know what Paul says later? He says, even while I was a sinner, while I was yet in sin, his grace, his forgiveness was already in place. He provided himself before I was born. <laughs> so it's not a, a matter of who I am and what I'm able to do or how I can articulate things better than other people. That is why the Lord is using me. No, 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 no. Some of us don't even know how to plan our words. They just, you know, the way they come, just receive it and fix it, you know. Fix it. The past tense and present and the future, they are all in together, right? But as you're receiving it, fix it so that it makes sense. We don't know why God chooses to use people like Ananias. We don't know why he chooses to use people like me, people like you. Do you know? He uses the foolish things of this world to confound those who think they are very wise. In their own wisdom, they'll be brought low. You know what Paul is thinking, or oh, Saul of Tarsus? That I lived a lie until today. <laughs> and that means all these chief priests and everybody else in my company, they are still living a lie. Just translating what they know in their heads. Here, translating it to here is a problem. And the Lord is transforming this man that the knowledge he had is going to be used for the furtherance of the gospel. The Lord helped him to take it here to here. When it came here, you know what began to happen? He began praying. He began praying. And maybe he said, Lord, I have persecuted your people. Maybe I am ready. Maybe whatever you want me to do, I don't know. Even if it will cause or it will bring death upon me. Here I am, Lord. Let your will be done. I want to obey you above others. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And having his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now think about it. In, in his entire life, 
probably no one has come to him gently and call him brother. Brother. Might seem to be just, you know, a regular word that we use today. But I think for Paul, it meant everything. How is it that he's amongst the people I was coming to bring down to Jerusalem? I have persecuted these people. I have done more than enough harm to them. But what is he saying? He's calling me brother. <laughs> this, this will break a man. This will take you down on your knees. And to think about the kind of love that is found with these people who are called people of the way. The disciples and the saints. This kind of love is not found in the streets. It's not found with the chief priests. This was something else to Saul of Tarsus. Being called a brother. Say, the Lord who appeared to you is again reminding that the Lord, <laughs> the Lord has already prepared this man to come and maybe he's introduced himself that my name is Ananias and the Lord who appeared to you on the road has sent me to you so that you receive your sight. Why did the Lord send Simon the sorcerer, you remember him? Because he desired to do what? To lay his hands upon people to receive the Holy Spirit, to be healed. But we're not hearing about him. We are hearing of just any other regular person, like you and I, that the Lord is choosing to use. The Lord who appeared to you. On the road, he sent me so that you will receive your sight. You know what this communicates to this man, so is that this same Jesus has the power to make you blind, and he has the power to make you see. And what he did, he actually added a layer in his eyeball so that he couldn't see. Because when Ananias laid his hand upon him, the Bible says something like scale. They fell down. It's like when the Lord struck him, he did put something in his eye. Boop, boop. You ain't going to see until I say you can see. <laughs> and then Ananias came laid his hand upon him, and those things, they were visible, they were seen. Things like scale, they dropped down. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And you know who baptized him? Ananias. <laughs> and nobody that we didn't know about until right now. You don't need to have a big name for God to use you. You just need to be available and obedient and the Lord will use you. The hands of the Lord always wide open. His arms waiting for us to come. And say, Lord, Lord, I have come. Lord, I am here. Whatever place you will send me, I will go. Do not use any excuse not to obey the Lord. This kind of courage only comes when we obey the Lord. That I do not like this man. Lord, I don't like him. I don't like what he's done. I don't like this, 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 this. But because you have said it, I'm going to go. It is not my will, but... Your will be done. Your will be done. Friends, the Lord is calling us. 
I don't know what he's calling you to do as I bring the worship team to come. I don't know what the Lord is calling you to do. I don't know who he's sending you to. Would you obey the voice of the Lord? We are seeing from just the first inception of the New Testament church, the disciples of God, they're not finding it easy. But you know what they say every time they are called? They say, we must obey God over man. That is what we ought to remember. And this is what would carry us through. When they were whipped, they went back to the rest of the disciples. And you know, they didn't say, hey, now that there's trouble here, and they don't want us to preach in the name of Jesus, we are going to change locations. They didn't. In fact, they prayed that the Lord would open more doors and that the Lord would give them the courage to continue preaching. By interaction, I know that there are people that the Lord has called to be teachers of His Word, but they don't want to commit. Tell you, I still have this to do. I still have school to finish. I still have this to plan for. I still have this. How much time do you think you have? I mean, how much time do you think Ananias had before he was convicted to go and do God's will? Because just God came, spoke to him, he brought his concern, and the Lord said, well, whatever you're thinking, you go. I have sent you. Maybe there are people who are still in sin because we haven't gone to preach Jesus to them. Maybe. That is a higher probability. Maybe your neighbor doesn't go to church because you have not gone to share Christ with them. Maybe. The Lord is calling. You willing to obey. The result of this man's obedience was wonderful because he heeded the voice of God. He went and laid his hand upon Saul of Tarsus. Saul regained his sight and then they gave him food. And you know what happened immediately? He began to preach. <laughs> immediately, he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Think about this. So, who was a murderer, a killer, a persecutor of the church, is now born again, He's come to one of the synagogues in Damascus. And he's preaching. And you know what is happening with the people? The, the hall of the auditorium is dead quiet. You know why? Because they don't believe him. He just came on a mission to take people back to Jerusalem bound. He's right here preaching Jesus. This ain't real. And they're whispering in their neighbor's ears. Is this the same man? Is this the same man? Is this the same man? But you know what the Bible says? That soul of Tarsus grew even more. And he confounded the Jewish people living in Damascus. 
And he preached to them that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You know what? The, the writer is not telling us, Luke, that Saul was busy telling them about himself. <laughs> Saul is not in the business of explaining to the people who he is. They already know. He's in the business of presenting Jesus to the world. Jesus just told Ananias, this is what he's going to do. He's going to go to the Gentiles, to the kings, and to the children of Israel. Are you amongst these people that the Lord said? <laughs> Sometimes when people are presenting the gospel, you'll find, you know, over 60, 70 percent is just about themselves. It's about themselves themselves, themselves. Saul of Tarsus is preaching who? Jesus and Jesus alone. Listen. If you would preach Jesus and leave every other thing besides, we will experience an awakening, a revival in our times. You know, all we can do right now is to complain. And one thing that we are complaining about is the tax. We don't like it, and it's going up every day. Nothing you can do. In fact, others, the, those that have payrolls, you only realize that something has been cut off your salary when you're receiving your paycheck, right? It is fixed and you cannot bypass. <laughs> you're going to pay it. All you're thinking is, what are they going to do next week? What are they going to do tomorrow? Are you spending time thinking about what Jesus can do through your life? through you even right now, even the next minute, do you think about that? I mean, we, we, we're so concerned about it. We are consumed about it. Yet we know that we do not hold the keys for tomorrow. Hearing the rumors of war and wars, we know that the return of the Lord is at hand. It might hit today when you're thinking about your paycheck. <laughs> hit today when you're thinking about that bill, this bill, this bill, this bill. Listen, the Lord will always provide for us no matter what. Whether it gets to whatever percentage, the wickedness of this government is not going low, I pray that when they are increasing in their wickedness, the church will increase in their righteousness. In our right standing with God. We will increase in holiness. Instead of sitting somewhere there and complaining. I pray that we will spend our time wisely. David said, Lord, help me to number my days so that I will be wise in them. I don't want a day to be wasted. I don't want an hour to be wasted. Are you going to obey the Lord when he calls on you? And when you have received his voice, what are you going to do? You're going to sit or you're going to move. Immediately, Saul of Tarsus received his sight, was given food, and he knew his assignment. I am called to preach Jesus. And he confounded the wisdom of many of these Jewish people, the people who knew uh, 
the prophecies, the people who knew a lot of things that were written. He could explain to them word for word because he knew the written word and now the same written word has come upon him. He's experienced the same written word, the word of God, Jesus himself. I don't know what you do after receiving that revelation that indeed he is Christ. He is the Lord of all. And this is what he wants me to do. He's not calling us to, you know, not every one of us is going to be a missionary. Not every one of us is going to be a pastor or a deacon. But the Lord can use you greatly. Get this idea of your head that God can only use those specific few people. If you're willing and obedient, God can use you. And He's ready to use you. What a wonderful God. Lord, we are before your presence again, asking of you that you would fill us again, fill us with your presence, grant us wisdom that the knowledge we have received from you we will rightly apply it to our lives. I pray for those of us who have been procrastinating about the things you've called us to do. I pray that you give us or you grant us the urgency of doing your, your will. The urgency of being witnesses. For we do not know the time or the day all we know is that your return is at hand. So help us, God. Help us. Those of us, like Saul of Tarsus, who took your grace for granted, I pray that you forgive us, Lord. I pray that there will be a great change of heart. I pray that we will refocus and rethink. Oh, God, you're faithful. We thank you. And in this morning as we also serve you, as we worship you with our offerings, we pray that we'll give that which will bring you glory and honor. We bless you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.